Welcome everyone to this lightning talk on automation gone wrong, lessons learned from screwing up your network automation. My name is Marcel. I'm an API and programmability lead in the EMER region here at Cisco. And that means I, I work with our large customers on everything related to programmability, APIs, automation in general. And I come from a programming background starting to program at the age of 10 and have fallen particularly in love with the entire topic of net DevOps, and I've recently also written a book about that topic on using Python to automate your network infrastructure. Now, if we look at what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis as an infrastructure engineer, there's all of these words, right? All of these things that we have to do, like uh, rollbacks, like removing sites, updating DNSs, integrations, adding new ISPs, changing site names, setting up guest networks. And I'm sure you can come up with a bunch of more tasks that you have that you need to do. And these tasks keep on piling up while at the same time, we wanna move faster and faster. And the answer that has sort of come out to do that is automation, right? We have all, you're at DevNet Create, so you've probably all seen this, this pitch for automation where we say, hey, we're going from this, this circle of fear where changes happen very rarely, where all changes are big and all of these changes are complex. And we have a team that isn't very well practiced. The change is seen as a very high risk we have problems occurring during that change. Uh, that change is seen as a failure. And then since no one likes to uh, likes to do failures over and over again, changes happen even less rarely, right? This is this, this circle of fear, that spiral of death that we sort of are in. And we have sort of said, hey, we can use automation. We can use this idea of net DevOps to go to a culture of change where we can have changes happen very often, where all of these changes are very, very small. The team is well practiced. Change is seen as low risk problems occur during the change, A, that's natural, but we have a way to identify the problem quickly and we have a way to resolve the problem very, very fast. And thus, even if there are problems during our change, we don't see that as a failure, but rather we see that as, a, as an opportunity to test our fallback mechanisms and we can still do changes very often. No? This, is, this is the whole idea behind that DevOps and might be sold on this already. So you're, it's a nice Friday afternoon. Uh, you're here in EMER, America's just came online and you're just pushing one small change, right? Kicking off one automation workflow before you go into, into your well-deserved weekend. Now, during that weekend, you might end up looking at your phone, down at your phone and you see something odd. Hey, there's a bunch of emails in your inbox and there's a bunch of messages directed to you in your chat. And finally, there is a bunch of missed calls because you know what? The little automation workflow you just kicked off completely screwed your network and and the Americas was out of your uh, out of ISP or out of internet access. So automation allows us to do all of these workflows very, very efficiently, but that also means that if we do something wrong with our automation, well, we're kind of screwing up the entire operation or we can screw up bigly. To, to say it in the words of Bill Gates, once said that, hey, the first rule of technology used in a business is that automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify the efficiency, right? If we do this, we can make things very, very fast. We can make sure that everything runs very, very smoothly and we can do orders of magnitudes more of workflows in the same time. But the second rule is that automation applied to an inefficient operation will magnify this inefficiency. That means if you screw up something with your, uh, with your automation, you are going to screw up your infrastructure big time. So what can we do in order to avoid these? And what, what kind of workflows can we implement in order to avoid these total failures, right? What can we do to avoid you getting those massive amounts of emails, those massive amounts of direct messages, and that massive amount of phone calls when you're just rolling out a simple change? Well, if you look at a normal net DevOps pipeline, this is just an example of how such a pipeline, like the different high-level stages that such a pipeline can have, we have in the beginning the design changes, the testing of the changes, the rollout of the changes, and then at the end, the monitoring of these problems. Each of these stages, we can do things to make sure that in the case of a failure, we are able to recover faster and we can sometimes even prevent failures from happening in the beginning. So the first of these things is in the design phase, go ahead and design your changes with rollback in mind. What does that mean? Well. The easiest way to say is, hey, we can just take a backup of our network configuration of our device configuration. And here's 16 lines of Python code that can actually do this um, using, using NetMeco to do that. So you can see here, 
this is the uh, the file, and if we go ahead and we execute that, we can execute that, and what we get at the end is just a backup of our configuration. That looks like like this. Now, this is a rollback mechanism, but this is not the ideal rollback mechanism because we will get all of the stuff, all of the things in there. What we can also do if you're using, for example, something like PyATS or GN Genie to define your network changes, we can actually use PyATS to build us not only the required configuration changes, in this case, we're adding a new interface with an IP address, a net mask, uh, and we're enabling it, but we can also tell PyATS, hey, go ahead, or Genie in this case, go ahead and configure or generate the configuration needed to undo this change. So if that change, that specific change, was the one that caused you problems. Well, you already have the rollback built in. So you can see here, this is the configuration change that was generated. And this is the unconfiguration that we used to, that we could use to, to go back. Next up in our DevOps pipeline would be the testing stage. So we are testing our changes. We're checking that everything goes well. And here, make sure that you're actually testing Funny story, there's some people that actually screwed up their production infrastructure because they forgot to flip the, the target environment from testing to from, from production to testing, and they deployed their testing changes into production. But make sure that you're testing what you're actually doing and that you're testing in a realistic environment, be it a simulated environment like CML or be it a, a proper lab setup. Make sure that you can test in a proper environment and make sure that these changes that you're testing and your tests are actually covering the changes that you're testing. Next step is then to roll out the changes. And this is sort of a second cousin to what I said in the beginning, where you wanna be able to have these configuration changes, you wanna have a way of rolling back those changes, and you wanna be able to roll out changes fast. So you wanna optimize for speed, especially in the case of an emergency, right? Especially if something is wrong, if something if you have to roll back, you don't wanna wait hours upon hours for your automation to kick off and, and do its thing and, and reach all of the devices. You want that to be as, as fast as possible so that you can then go ahead, uh, ahead and figure out what actually went wrong. So you wanna optimize for speed. And especially if you're using SSH-based automation like PyATS or um, NetMeco, it's not that easy to optimize the speed of the operation itself, but what you can do is you can parallelize your execution, right? You can go ahead and do all of these different devices, for example, in parallel. Now, what you could do is you have a queue of, of jobs that you want to have done. So these are, for example, a configuration change that you want to apply to each of your devices. And each of these red boxes represents a, a job. And this job now contains the configuration change that you desire, right? The, in this case, we're again configuring an interface. It contains the connection information and it also contains what you actually want to do. In this case, the job name, apply, apply configuration. And then we can have a worker or multiple workers pick up those jobs, figure out, okay, I have to connect to switch one with these credentials and roll out these configuration changes. Let me go ahead and do that. Now, sounds extremely complicated. Uh, you might be wondering how much does that does that take to do? Uh, let's do that in 30 lines of Python code. So you can again go over here to the editor. So we first define the task. These are the functions that the workers will be able to run. So in this case, the apply config, which simply uses NetMeco again to send a set of configuration commands. And then we need a script to put uh, to open up a queue. We're using our queue here, Redis queue. Um, this is the configuration commands you want to do. This could, for example, also come from your uh, single source of truth, from your templates. The connection details, they could come from an IPAM. And then I down here, I just enqueue this job. And if we jump into the terminal here and do queue sample, you see that I now have a job with the ID, with this ID queued. And I can go ahead and do start a worker node here. And now the worker is going to pick up that job and carry it out. 30 lines of Python for an asynchronous processing of our, of our network changes. And then the final step is, of course, building a monitoring solution that captures everything, right? You want to have a dashboard like this that covers all of the data, that gets all of your data um, to, so that you can roll out your changes and monitor that everything is, uh, is good. 
With that, thank you very much for attending this session. And uh, all of the source code is available on GitHub.